let's get going. It's really wonderful to see you all here. And um, I'm Amy Antonucci with Seacoast Permaculture, and I'm going to kind of set the stage here and get us going. Um, tonight's event was put together by Seacoast Permaculture and the Northeast Organic Farming Association of New Hampshire, and also co-sponsored by Open Democracy and Cedar Circle Farm and Education Center in Vermont. So for the next hour, we'll be hearing questions that arose from you all from the film, Seeds of Vandana Shiva, and passing them on to our panelists. Kate Dusterberg, Olivia Zink, and Tony Van Winkle. Um, you know, the effort here being to learn, get even more out of this really important and I thought beautiful film. We do have some questions that were already submitted to start us off, but also Laura is going to be gathering more from the chat from all of you. So you can start putting them in there. <laughs> Lots of questions for you too, but you can feel free to use that. Let me say a couple words about Zoom etiquette, just a reminder about, you know, keeping yourselves muted being the biggest thing if you aren't the one talking. Um, but as I said before, we're really happy to see your faces. So would love it if people cut, you know, if you keep your camera on. But since we're recording for later use, we understand if you don't want to do that. Um, I do want, oh, I see, I'm going to have an issue. So I want to say a few words, um, and then we'll, I'll put up a, a, a map for you. But so permaculture and the organic farming movement have learned a lot from indigenous people, past and present, near and far, and both to acknowledge the source of that inspiration and learning, and also to deepen our connection to the land that we are living on. We want to acknowledge. Sorry, screen share is a little funky. There we go. Yes, we just want to take a moment to acknowledge that the land that many of us, at least on this on this call, um, are on the traditional, ancestral, and current homeland of Abenaki, Wabanaki and where I am, specifically Penacook people. We wanna be thankful to them for the amazing job that they've done storting this beautiful land and these beautiful waters that we are privileged to be on. This map is from Indigenous New Hampshire and I'm gonna put a link in the chat. They are working out of Durham and invite us to join them. The other thing I want to say is that indigenous people, you may all know this, comprise less than 5% of the world's population, but they protect 80% of global biodiversity. So our efforts to continue to honor them and actively support them is really a matter of survival for us all. So I really encourage us all to stay connected to that, those efforts. So let me quickly kind of I know I can't see many faces, but who here, how many growers do we have with us? Anyone want to put up a hand, give us a little, anyone here food growing folks? Who here consider themselves activists? Okay, I know we can't see a lot of faces, but that gives us a, a bit of a sense of who's here, which is really helpful for the panel. And it's excellent to have a mix of people here. Um, so I first learned personally about Vandana Shiva as a first year student at UNH. In my intro to women's studies class, we read Staying Alive, her first book and at the time her only book. Um, and her work really helped me to link my feminist activism with the environment and eventually with farming. And I'd like to ask each of our panelists to say a few words now about the projects that they're doing and how they connect with the issues that Vandana works on. Let's start with Kate. Let me say a few words about her. Kate Dusterberg co-founded Cedar Circle Farm and Education Center in Vermont. 
She served on the board of NOFA Vermont and Grow Ahead and is a member of the Standards Board for the Real Organic Project. Kate worked at the University of Vermont, leading the effort to establish a Center for Sustainable Agriculture and also worked with the Women's Agricultural Network at UVM. So Kate, why don't you unmute and um, speak to how your projects connect with Fondanas. Okay, thank you, Amy. And thanks to everyone for being here. Um, so uh, for the past 20 years, it's the longest job I've ever had, um, I have been a co-manager of Cedar Circle Farm. Um, my husband and I took over the management of the farm in 2000. And along with our partner, who um, is one of the funders of the project, um, we wanted to establish a community-based farm and one that's also an activist farm because we both, both my husband and I have been involved in farm politics and trying to change agriculture for our entire adult lives, basically. Um, and I, for myself, I've been, I've worked like, as Amy said, at the university level, I worked for several NGOs um, in the one in the Midwest and one in, in Vermont, rural Vermont. Um, to as a community activist and and worked on a lot of policy issues as well both state and federal so then coming to the farm as you like just more of like hands on the ground you know sort of um that gave me another uh way to try to affect the food system I mean, the big goal of our farm is really to change the food system because we we realize and feel, and it's one of the things I've always been inspired from Vandana about that um, everything's interconnected, obviously, but food is you know so our basic connection to life and to the earth, and if we can you know, farm well, grow our food well in a way that nourishes the soil. And in fact, you know, over the years, we've been learning how much the soil, how much potential the soil has to, um, you know, more efficiently cycle carbon in ways that can um, mitigate climate change. Um, so it's not only um, it's not only that it's going to be like right good farming right farming is going to have an effect on um, us right at home right on our farms going to have an effect um, on the health of our consumers and on you know the natural resources on which we depend and as well hopefully on the environment regarding um, our ability to bring down more carbon in the ways that we farm. So we're, our whole dedication really at the farm, not only is producing food for our community and producing healthy food, um, it's um, to try to help consumers understand that relationship between food and the environment and their health and the health of the community. And I've, I've heard Vandana speak so eloquently about this so many times and you all probably did in the film and everything. And so she has been a great inspiration to us at the farm. She's even been to our farm, which is cool. Um, and because, because of our, we were um, involved in an activist effort to try to get GMO labeling in Vermont. You guys might've heard about that, that short-lived law. But Vonina was so excited about it that she, um, on one of her trips to the US, she came to the farm to meet with some of the activists. So it was really, it was really cool for us. Um, that might be it for now. Um, also, yeah, I can talk about this as we go into the questions, but we are still involved with um, organizations that um, are also like trying to, to have, an effect on ag policy and stuff like that. So, but I think we'll go into that later, right, Amy? Yeah, that'd be good for me. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. So let me introduce Olivia. So Olivia Zink 
is going to be next up. She's been a community organizer in New Hampshire since 2000. She was a founding member of Save Our Groundwater, a citizen action group which helped to stop a proposed bottled water plant in the seacoast of New Hampshire, in fact, in the town I live in. So I am eternally grateful to them that my aquifer remains here for me. Um, that work led her to visit Vandana Shiva and Navdanya as part of the 2005 UN Conference on Women and Water. She's now Executive Director of Open Democracy and a City Councilor for Franklin, New Hampshire. She and I have worked on both environmental and peace issues, and I'm really thrilled to have her with us. So uh, let me remind you, Olivia, the question is, um, just or the opportunity to say a few words about the projects you're involved in that connect with these same issues Vandana is passionate about. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Amy. And as I, I kept come from this work, not as a grower, but as a water advocate. Um, and, and I think that there, as we sort of think about the interconnection of water, um, water is our life um, blood, but also the interconnection um, to um, democracy, and that is the issue I'm sort of really focused on now, and who, you know, really advocating for federal reform around the Freedom to Vote Act and having, ensuring that we're not having policy that's driven by large corporations. And I think the interconnection between me and her work right now is sort of thinking about and I, and I think her book really does this really well. Um, so I'm just gonna actually quote her words as um, how we interconnect because um, she talks about how we're witnessing the growth in two forces, one of globalization and the other of localization. One driven by global corporations and the other driven by local communities and grassroots movements. And in a de democracy, we must ensure that the voices of ordinary people are who guide um, our, our policies. And I think that's from her book, Earth Democracy. And I think um, in many ways, those words even weren't written today, ring true today. Beautiful, thank you, Olivia. Um, and now for Tony. Tony Van Winkle is a cultural anthropologist, a gardener, forager, cook, and ardent seed saver. He was a professor at Sterling College teaching sustainable food systems, focusing on traditional and indigenous subsistence systems um, and food sovereignty movements. He's now working um, at, is it Guilford College in North Carolina? And again, Tony, our question here, is um, could you say a few words about the projects you're doing that connect to the same issues Vandana is working, has been working on? Go ahead, Tony. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Vandana has been, I don't know, tremendously influential in so many ways um, as a grower, as an activist, as a teacher. So I've been teaching in sustainable food systems um, really for about 10 years, but in a sustainable food system specifically identified program for the last five, um, both as, as uh, Amy said at Sterling and now at Guilford College. So uh, Vandana's books uh, have been important in classes and teaching. So I've, I've been teaching for the last five years um, and uh, kind of an intro to sustainable food systems course, 100 level entry course for intended for first year, first time college students. Um, of course, sometimes we get upper uh, the upperclassmen in there as well, and uh, settled on after really many years of trying to figure out what the right book was for discussion. So it's a you know it's kind of a split course between very experiential based uh, field <clears throat> activities, uh, some lecture to convey you know really important uh, foundational concepts, and then also some considerable discussion element. So what's the best discussion text you know for the class? And uh, eventually I, I settled on and have been using it now, I guess for the last, um, I think three, definitely three, maybe four years is uh, who really feeds the world. So that's that's the discussion text for my intro class. Um, and, and that text, uh, Vandana touches on, you know, many of the issues that um, are raised in the film, uh, seeds, 
uh, are another major intersectional piece for um, for my work and and how Vandana has inspired it. So I've been saving seeds both um, personally and uh, I, I guess professionally. I'm, I'm not sure if that's the right way to put that. Um, it's more a labor of love than <laughs> you know a remunerative thing. But um, so saving seeds for uh, for myself as well as for others, and in, including rematriation efforts in in Vermont. Uh, specifically involving the Western Abenaki peoples and, and more specifically yet the Nulhegan band. Uh, so I've done a, a good bit of work in rematriation uh, with with those folks. Um, and, uh, and and as I said, have been saving seeds for a long time besides. Uh, also, I guess the, the other way that it intersects pretty directly is, uh, so I, I, I'm an educator. I've also been a grower, still am a grower, though not, you know, um professionally so to speak but uh have been involved in the management of two college farms now and those college farms and how we organize them um the intentionality of those farms has been deeply informed by vandana shiva's work and specifically from uh once again who really feeds the world the last chapter the concluding chapter uh she goes into what she calls seed to table cycles and these involve these kind of four nodes uh, of um, of development, of attention, of you know, in intentionality, and those include the the nodes of living seeds, living soils, living food economies, and seeds of knowledge. The last one being sort of the you know the educational piece, um, agroecological education, or, or or whatever your preferred descriptor. Um, Seeds being, you know, of course, uh, foundational to food sovereignty. You can't have food sovereignty without seed sovereignty. Um, so trying to initiate each of those things in a very intentional way in the structure and development, not only the college farm, but its curricular intersections as well, as well as its non-curricular, more community-focused intersections in terms of living food economies and, and things like that. Um, so I've probably said enough for now. So I'll return later to other things. Thanks. Sure. Thank you, Tony. And um, I'm glad you mentioned that book. NOFA and um, NOFA New Hampshire and Seacoast Permaculture did a book study on who really feeds the world last winter. She does an amazing job of answering that question that many of us here, can this really feed the world? <laughs> right? Sort of the challenge many of us get and she gives a real answer so we highly recommend you check that out okay so we're moving on with more questions remember folks that you can use the chat to put your own in but we do have some have some pre pre-asked ones we're going to move on with and this next one is really action oriented because we hear from people a lot what can i do i want to be involved but i don't know how to help and i don't feel like i can make a difference and we really, we know that you can. So the question is, I'm gonna first, actually, I'm gonna go to Tony first with this one. What are some actions you would recommend for people who care about seed and biodiversity protection, um, given how these are being undermined, especially by corporate and industrial forces? So could you speak to that seed and biodiversity protection and what people can do? Tony. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, right. I, you know, I think um, maybe my default is always going to be, you know, study, <laughs> do, do your research and figure out, um, be careful about your sourcing. If you're not saving your own seeds, uh, which is fine. Um, you know, different folks have different capacities for, for doing that. And there is a bit of, uh, there's a learning curve there for, you know, some things are more challenging than others in terms of seed saving. Uh, but if you're not saving your own seeds, um, you know, just do your uh, research on your sourcing. Um, I have a lot of pretty strong opinions about that that I'll withhold for now. But, um, you know, some companies, there's a lot of companies out there that are good, um, who are great for sourcing seeds, uh, many in New England, or a couple anyway. Um, I've always been a big fan of Fedco um, because of their... Uh, structure as a as a co-op as a worker owned co-op uh so you know that's a plus for me so their economic structure i think is is great and models that kind of living food economy uh thing um 
they've also done some really important work in um, uh, indigenous uh, royalties. So they've been doing that work for a while now, which is really important. So, you know, you'll see some companies who are actively providing royalties to indigenous at attributed crops, seeds. Um, uh, personally, I think that's very important. Uh, they also recently have entered into kind of a cost sharing program with um, African-American identified seeds as well. So they're doing a lot of good work in that regard. Um, other seed companies do similarly good work. So, you know, again, do your research, um, figure out who's, who's doing the work, you know. Um, I, I think getting involved in seed saving if you're not, um, if it's intimidating, you know, just try beans or something. Beans are really easy. Um, and as Vandana Shiva says, one of my favorite quotes, you know, seed saving is a political act. Um, so just the act alone <laughs> is contesting the privatization of essentially life, right? Like the, the reproductive capacity of plants is what we're talking about here. And it's no small matter um, uh, that, that, uh, that, that the efforts of corporations to privatize and enclose what has previously been an open source commons, you know, for millennia, humans have saved and shared seeds, right? It's sort of a given uh, right even. Um, so just engaging in the act alone is an act of defiance, some, some might say. Um, I would agree with that on however small a scale. And then if you can scale out from there and start sharing, you know, that's the next piece. Um, I really believe in open source and, and um, you know, free seed when it's possible. Although, you know, again, companies making a living doing this, there's nothing inherently wrong with that perhaps, but um, it does raise questions of, you know, um, seeds as a right or seeds as a commodity and the original commodification of seeds. So it gets us into some of those uh, deeper uh, foundational questions. Um, seed libraries are a good way to kind of get involved. Uh, many local communities now are doing seed libraries. They can be really great for finding local, locally produced seeds that are probably in all likelihood adapted to where you are. Um, that's another reason to do it for climate adaptation purposes. Um, seed libraries are good. Always remember, if you do participate in seed libraries, the intention there is it's a lending institution where you know you're you're expected to give back, right? So, I think some seed libraries struggle because of that that element often kind of falls to the side. You know, people get the seeds and they're excited about it, which is awesome, and they grow those out. But then you know maybe you have a crop failure, you know, and you can't take seeds back. But um, do your best to do that. And then if you can support as growers in particular, this is the last thing I'll mention, um, seed rematriation efforts, as I've already mentioned, we did that at Sterling, um, launching sort of parallel programs in, at, in North Carolina now at Guilford. Uh, but Vermont, for example, uh, has Ver NOFA Vermont in the last um, two years, I believe, uh, has initiated what's called the Vermont Land Link Project. So if you're a grower and you have land, um, you can partner with the Abenaki tribe and grow out, you know, endangered, rare, or otherwise important, culturally important seeds uh, on behalf of the Abenaki peoples. And so there are ways you can get back as a grower, um, get involved in those sorts of projects. Um, I'm not sure if that's happening in New Hampshire, but I, I think it probably is, but I'm not absolutely sure. Um, so those are some ways that you can get involved with seeds, but just start doing it. <laughs> That's the best thing. Thank you, Tony. I'm going to ask of the folks here, who here is involved in a seed library in your area? Penny, I want to see your hand. Yeah. Um, and I can't see everyone, you know, not everyone is visible, but I want to say, if you are involved, put it in the chat. Let us know about it, what's out there, and who is doing it. That would be great to have that resources shared with each other. Um, OK, so now I want to ask the same sort of question around action um, to Olivia. So Olivia, what are some actions that you'd recommend for people who care about um, the, the about challenging corporate control and anti-democratic movements? What can people do? So I think 
um, all actions are, re are really needed, whether that is a, you are a seed saver or whether that's you're an advocate for policies at your local level, your state level, or the federal level, or globally. Um, I think it's really important, though, as we think about what actions to take, is building a community or a team around you. Um, because when we individually save our seeds in our garden or we individually take action, it's not as powerful as collective action. And we can really spark a revolution if we really understand the roots of the problems with corporate control of agriculture and, and anti-democracy, anti-democratic um, ideas that are infiltrating our society and really being part of the solution. And I really urge people to sort of start where they're at with, um, with their activism, but even saying that you watch this film and sharing it with your state representatives and asking them what agricultural policies can we advocate um, on. But I think that there's so much to do. Sometimes people feel overwhelmed with the volume of activities and just, um, are you a writer um, and can contribute uh, by writing um, a piece about the film you watched and, and sending it as a letter to the editor? Or are you an artist and can contribute to the movement um, by, by uh, you know, just by doing art and contributing these messages to the movement? I think there's so many ways that we all, you know, I, I'm not able to create a TikTok video. That's not my skill set, but somebody might have that skill set to share about why we need to um, really be thoughtful about the food we we consume and, and grow and also around the public policies around corporate control of our water supply, of our agriculture, and, and of lots of different things because we know the people making campaign contributions are the ones guiding the policies and our voices are sometimes left out and we can't be silent on these issues. Thanks, Olivia. Um, yeah, okay. Um, Kate, I have one for you. I'd like you to speak to actions that you'd recommend for people who care about promoting sustainable, ecologically sound eating and growing practices and networks in our region. Go ahead, Kate. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so. Um, I mean, obviously everybody knows that the one of the most important things they can do is eat organic food and support the growers in their community, but also asking the questions, I think it's really important about, um, even at your co-ops and stuff, because there's so much controversy around what's real organic, right? And, um, this has become more and more important uh, in the last num maybe four or five years because uh, the national um, organic standards are not so strong anymore and they're allowing um, things to be called certified organic that shouldn't be that are really, you know, everybody knows about this. I mean, like the CAFOs and the, um, and the farms that are uh, allowed to be called organic that are growing hard hydroponically and not even growing in the soil. So there is there are a couple of movements um, around trying to have an additional level of certification. Um, one is started right in our area. It's called Real Organic Project. Probably a lot of folks know about that, but they're already, they've grown so quickly. They're already certifying. And it obviously people who are certified as real organic also have to be the baseline USDA standards, but there's additional um, uh, certification standards and one one is of course no no um, CAFOs and no hydroponics and then they have um, additional uh, animal care standards and so on so I think people if you know the citizens if you're trying to really support 
organic, you have to kind of go beyond just like the USDA organic piece of it. And, you know, we could be asking that question in your grocery store, like, were these raspberries grown hydroponically, even though they're organic, they, you don't even know if their roots have touched the soil. So um, that kind of thing, I think is important. And also people uh, can get involved in like organizations that, um, that support policies um, that promote regenerate regenerative farming. Um, there's, um, Will's just reminding me there's another organization also real uh, regenerative organic that um, is an, an add on to the organic, you know, that has trying to bring more integrity to the organic certification pro process. And the um, regenerative organic coalition um, also has people who are certified regenerative organic also have um, a requirement to um, show that they're being, um, they have a social justice aspect to their farm, that they're treating their workers well, or that they're, so, um, so that's, I think that's important too. Um, I don't know, do you want me to mention other organizations that are policy oriented that people can maybe look into if they already don't know, maybe people, everyone knows about these organizations too, I don't know. Um, do you have like like a quick list to put some yeah, names I was thinking um, for national organizations, there's um, Organic Farmers Association, which is um, focuses, focuses on federal policy around organic and regenerative farming systems, just trying to support. And they also have regional representatives who are mostly farmers or, you know, consumers like you all. And um, so that's a good organization to get involved with when you're looking toward federal policy. There's also the National Organic Coalition tries to ha uh, have influence over their um, organic standards board and also looks into you know promoting federal policies that are good for organic um, the national family farm coalition i was thinking about this as um tony or olivia was talking because they they are involved with things with issues also that promote um sustainable farming but also things like um um, that have to do with breaking up um, like livestock, the livestock control issue. And um, so I think they're good on that point. Um, let's see, those are the, yeah, those are the main ones I was thinking of at the federal level. And everybody knows the state level ones like Dauphin, New Hampshire, Nova Vermont, and rural Vermont. Mm -hmm organizations that are represented here so yeah i think it's important you know that's one way you can find you know people who are like-minded and who can inform you on what's going on in in montpelier and yeah so great those are my ideas thanks kate well you know i think one of the most beautiful things that found on a shiva said in the film was that it's when we understand that we're not alone mm -hmm. that we see how interconnected we are um then our the whole potential of what we can do changes so yeah i think remembering that we don't we're not in this alone and reaching out and joining with others um through other organizations that are already going and working on everything we can think of or for instance someone has just put in the um in the chat that they are starting a seed let me see a seed savers collaborative in the moose region of new hampshire so it's these ways that we come together and work together that is really very very powerful um that amplifies the individual efforts that we all want to be involved in so that's great um so i wanted to next um 
so and this this ties in so many folks that I talk to are really discouraged by how difficult it is to create change on a policy level. But Vandana Shiva spoke to some frankly amazing successes <laughs> that she's been involved in right maybe giving us you know a different perspective on what's possible. So the question is what national well it could be any local national international policies can we support um, that are working on these issues and maybe olivia you know these issues being food farming environment democracy women's rights all these things that she is so involved in so olivia do you have some thoughts on that um so my first thought is really that we need to elect women, um, indigenous people, farmers um, at the local level, at the state level. Um, we need to elect those leaders that share our values, um, that can look at um, policies through the lens that we see them um, and, and to really build those inter interconnections. So um, the first part is, is electing leaders who support these concepts. Um, and are not associated sort of with the corporate strategy or movement. Um, and then I went to her website and I found the Universal De Declaration of Rights for Mother's Earth. And I'll post a link to that in the chat because I think that's, if we're gonna fight for one international policy, that might be the one um, to fight for. But I think there's lots of um, ways where we can create policy change changes fight for policy changes. You know, I, I feel like years ago we fought to change water policy in New Hampshire, and I thought for sure we were never going to succeed. It always felt like we were, um, you know, it, policy change takes a long time. And my um, other recommendation is that when you support these national and international policy changes or local policy changes, um, have some patience with your advocacy too, because the change that we want to see doesn't always appear overnight, but that that arc of justice does bend in the right direction. Thank you, Olivia. Kate, I think you had some thoughts on this as well. I'm not sure if... <sighs> I've sort of mentioned some of the organizations that work on national national policies and state level policies. Um, but I agree with Olivia that it does take patience and I don't know, sometimes I find myself hopeful about the ability to change policy, especially at the federal level, and sometimes I don't feel hopeful. And I feel like, oh, people's efforts should be more, you know, at the local or maybe state level, if you live in a state like ours, especially. Um, but it go, it points to some of the other things that you, you were saying, Olivia, about getting the right people elected who really have that vision of what needs to be changed. I mean, for goodness sake, we're working at the at the federal level with these antiquated laws that support the production of corn and soybeans and um, wheat. And it, it, it's, um, it's, it all needs to be like really broken up and shaken up and figuring out ways that, that we can promote, um, programs that enable farmers to change the way they're farming, especially obviously in the Midwest, and enable them to actually make a living at farming the way they should be farming. I mean, some of the direct programs that, for example, can support um, um, more farmers as they, as they do a transition from maybe conventional to organic or organic to regenerative. I mean, like the, um, the, the pro, uh, program that supports research and research that uh, like sustainable egg, uh, 
education research, like the SARE program, um, the program that supports that there needs to be more funding to actually support the organic certification program. And there needs to be more funding um, for, you know, conservation of land and, and especially of transitioning land to from organic to regenerative or this any any transition away from chemical based agriculture and away from like agriculture, the type of agriculture that you uses a lot of tillage and so on. So um, I think, you know, just being involved and in learning from the programs or the or organizations that we were sort of talking about before would be um, really important. Um, Cause there are some really smart people who work for those organizations and they know um, they've been working on policy for a long time. So that's what I have to say on that. Great, thank you, Kate. Uh, we actually have a question that we want to pose to all of you to share with each other, really, to use the chat. Um, if you want to share what inspired you, how are you inspired by this film, by Vandana's work? Um, we'd love for you to, to put that in the chat. Uh, and. We'll, we'll try to read a few of those. Laura, are there any questions from the chat that we should check in on? Uh, just a couple. Uh, how would someone find the closest seed saving bank near them? Um, they're in Northampton, Mass, but how would you find your local seed saving group? Does, who knows where to go to, to look that up? Anyone? Tony. I'd say, yeah, just start with your uh, like Seacoast permaculture, you know, groups that are uh, deeply involved in local uh, food and agriculture efforts, you know, find those folks and they can probably point you in the right direction. And, um, you know, sometimes they're, well, sometimes they're easy to find, sometimes they're not so easy to find. <laughs> but, um, yeah, check with your, your local permaculture organization. Many towns, regions have them now. Um, so I'm sure someone at one of those could help you. Your state level organizations like NOFA New Hampshire, NOFA uh, Mass, NOFA Vermont, et cetera. All of those are, are great resources for sort of uh, checking what your local resources are. They keep tabs on all of that. Um, start with those. Great. Good advice. Laura, what else? Uh, how do we get more people to see this movie? Yes. Um, so a lot of us think this is a great movie for, for folks to see. And how do we, we uh, get it out there? Well, I guess I'll say that hosting screenings like this or conversations after screenings um, with a panel or not, you know, you could just have it be a discussion um, is one way to, to continue to spread the word that this film has been made and is out there and is, I think, a really, you know, it's, it's not, I, I have people sometimes say, oh, all these films about how terrible things are and just really focused on that. And while this, of course, is addressing the really big issues that we're facing, you know, the focus on what she has done and what the movements around her have done was, I just thought, so inspiring and um, uplifting. So I do think it's a good one to encourage folks to see. Anyone else, any other panelists have an idea or someone can put in the chat? Um, oh, other ways to, um, to spread the word about it. And all of you here? can tell one person you know that they've got to see this film, <laughs> right? Or more than one. Laura, are there any others? Uh, no questions, but there's some comments coming in if you'd like me to read some. Yes, that would be really lovely. Oh, I've got a question. I'll okay. read one first. Um, let's see, there are lots of things happening. <laughs> um, Georgia says that 
Vanana is the epitome of feminine power. It's the power commitment and no nonsense energy behind her work that inspires me most. Um, I will jump to a question. Uh, how does she persevere through such hostility, denial of facts, money and power? How does she do that? Or is that a comment? Well, I'm gonna shift that a little. Okay. Um, to saying how do some you know to our panelists i because I, I that has struck me about vandana every time i've seen her um i remember being at the common ground fair in september of 2001 when she managed to get there from india and speak to us about food and peace and how to connect with each other i don't know who else was there anyone else did i see anyone else there um and she was amazing and there is this whole this sense of um grace and optimism that she carries and i'm going to ask what some of you on the panel do and everyone can write in the chat what do you do to keep that going i'm not sure what she does but what do you all do to keep that spirit alive even in the face of difficulties anyone have an answer? Olivia. Um, when I met her and went to her farm in India, I met her brother. And I, I want to say that I think she particularly has a very foundational family that supports her work. Um, and many um, folks that are doing this amazing work have to have that kind of support network and encouragement. Um, what struck me in the film is when she fought for her son and challenged India's law to, to have her own son. So I think, you know, she in many ways, whether it's been environmental policy, women's policies, or uh, farming policy, she, she really has the courage to say, I know what's right and I'm going to fight for what's right. And so I also think in many ways, we have to trust our sort of natural instincts on those leadership um, and, and, and really build the community we would like to see around us so that we can have that same um, power um, because we all need to be saying these things, challenging, challenging power and, and fighting for what we know is right. Tony, Kate, do you have anything to add to that? Or Laura, do you have more that you want to share with us from the chat? Tony, you want to say something? I mean, I, I guess I would just add that um, I think her grounding in, I mean, the film did a great job of sort of telescoping in and out, you know, to where she's very participatory on the one hand, engaging in, you know, what, you could call maybe citizen science or participatory research methods, things like that, being grounded in local community reality, um, rather than becoming sort of absorbed in the stratospherics of, you know, <laughs> intellectual debate or policy debate or whatever, always returning to ground that in local reality, global South realities too, you know, I think more specifically. And I, I think um, that that, continuously provides some grounding for for her work right that um validates it and you know when you see the impacts directly of things that others might be denying right i mean as she returns to again and again in her work over the long course of her pretty prolific publishing career you know it's the, the dismissal of local knowledge um the notion that you know this contrast between primitive and modern or primitive and whatever you know so traditional seeds are primitive you need to replace them with modern seeds anyway the point being the grounding in uh sort of the the real on the ground realities of people i think helps to sort of power her through i mean that's my intuitive interpretation of that thanks tony um, Laura, we are getting really close to the end here. Uh, Laura, do you want to share some other thoughts that, that people put into the chat? Sure, yeah, I have 
a bunch of comments. Um, so Jennifer says, Vandana's sense of women's power reminded me of Wangari Matai. I was struck by her steady focus on women as in a way more informed and moral than men corporations throughout the decades of her career and in a way that doesn't let science be equated with men. Um, and then from Margie, we have, I believe her quotes about what inspired her, like her father said, listen to your conscience and man can't hurt you. You are protected by greater powers. Um, let's see. Emily says that she lives, she lives the interconnectedness of it all, not just speaks of it. And she gives me courage. Should I keep reading more? Um, yeah, give us a couple more. I think it's really nice to hear each other's voices. Suze says Puerto Rico has worked hard to rebuild their farms with non-GMO seeds and a growing bank. Um, she would be pleased. Let's see. This person loved that she mentioned the small, oops, the small farmer is the last free person on this planet. Let's see. Joan says she likes to hang out with for, uh, forceful, confident, mouthy, loud women, and it pushes her to speak out and up. <laughs> uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Another good quote when money is your master, your conscience is no more your guide. Uh, let's see. Give me one more, Laura. All right, this is last one. Emily was shocked by the dismissal of Vandana by the New York Times and others. And when she first read Biopiracy in the late 90s, it was a paradigm shift for her. Um, she got the book at the Common Ground Fair and she's so glad this movie's out. A quote of, a favorite quote of mine from Vandana that I turn to when I'm feeling really burdened by the world is um people probably heard this she said you are not atlas carrying the world on your shoulder it is good to remember that the planet is carrying you so to remember that we are supported by an entire amazing biosphere that really is on our side would like us to create conditions for life um like everything around us is trying to do uh, in the natural, quote unquote, natural world. Okay, we're moving towards wrapping up here. An hour does seem to have flown by. Um, I have a few things I'd really love to share with you. So uh, first, I, I do want to let you know that we purposely had a really small fee for signing up for this because we want it to be inclusive, but the cost we're putting in the program did exceed what we make that way. So if you are able to contribute for, further, I'm going to put the links in the chat where you can, um, we're splitting the, the, you know, money and the cost. So if you contribute to either Seacoast Permaculture or No for New Hampshire, will um, really appreciate that. I also want you to know that you can find what our organizations are up to beyond this, because these are all very active organizations represented here through these links that I'll put down to NOFA New Hampshire, Seacoast Permaculture, Open Democracy New Hampshire, and Cedar Circle Farm and Education Center. Here, oh, it keeps switching. There we go. There are those. Um, and, you know, we really do thank you all for coming and participating. Again, it's through these connections with each other that we're really going to keep going and make, make the change that we want. And we want to thank our panelists for taking this time. So Kate Dusterberg, Olivia Zink and Tony Van Winkle. Can folks give a real visible round of applause? You can use those little messaging things, so reactions if you need to. And I um, pulled out a quote from the film to kind of close us off here. And I won't, um, I, 
six, I won't, uh, seven, sorry, I won't shut it, shut down the event quite yet. So you can go through the chat and see what other folks have said, because I, I think that's really inspiring too. But here's what Vandana said really close to the end. You are a living force in the world. The minute you see you are not alone, that you are interconnected with all other living beings, it changes your potential. And we can all find a place to be the change in the ecological food web. You can be a cook, a farmer, an artist, a scientist, an activist. We are all agents of change. And in this way, activism is now an ocean. So thanks for being drops in that ocean, because it really, really matters. And we're really happy to be on this journey with you all. And um, there's a lot more we can talk about. And in all these organizations, we'll be continuing to keep these conversations going as we have been. And we hope to see you at those. So thanks again.